Okay, so this is an educational lecture. So here are my disclosures. I am a consultant for these pharmaceutical companies that uh, work in the field of uh, thyroid hormones. Uh, well, why are we here today? And I think that we're here today because about 10 years ago, after 30 years of treating patients with hypothyroidism, two patients of mine convinced me that their treatment wasn't working. They had similar stories. They were teachers that lost their jobs while being appropriately treated. By that, I mean, they had normal TSH levels. So they were being treated according to clinical guidelines, and yet they were not feeling well. So because of these two patients, I really changed the focus of my research and put the treatment of hypothyroidism under the microscope. I basically questioned everything that I knew about treatment of hypothyroidism. And, and I started, as I started to look at what we knew about hypothyroidism back then, I, I looked very carefully. I went to PubMed, I, I searched for several studies. I, I bought some additional books to what I had. And I was surprised with what I found, honestly. Uh, I found, this was about 10 years ago, that as a group, Patients with hypothyroidism on levothyroxine and normal serum TSH levels, they exhibit a reduced quality of life. And they have also impaired cognitive functions such as learning issues, memory, attention, and cognitive speed. Uh, I also learned that levothyroxine treated patients, again, as a group with a normal TSH levels, they exhibit a slower metabolism. They weigh about 10 pounds more and have higher cholesterol levels. And uh, some patients, perhaps about 10 to 20%, and that number can be uh, discussed later on, seem to be particularly impacted by these residual symptoms. So at that point, I was really surprised because I didn't know much of this. And uh, for many, many times, I told my patients that were complaining about difficulty in managing their body weight. This, you know, no, that's has nothing to do with your thyroid anymore. The TSH is normal, so you should not have an issue with body weight. And the same thing with uh, cognitive functions and learning and everything. So I was really surprised by what I had found. Now, but then why are we here if so much was already known back in the 2010s? So this was already out there and still we have a problem with these things today. Now, unfortunately, many endocrinologists are not aware of this, as I wasn't aware, or passionately dispute these facts. And as a result, obviously patients are confused, patients feel unassisted. Understandably, they also complain about the perceived culture of dismissal by their physicians. So this is a problem. We have a big problem in our hands because hypothyroidism is so common and we have to fix it. How can we fix this? Well, to fix it, we first need to understand how patients with uh, hypothyroidism on levothyroxine have residual symptoms. Where are these symptoms coming from? Why, why do they exist? Well, there are probably several factors that contribute to residual symptoms, including age, sex, genetics, the existence of other conditions. For example, menopausal syndrome, this is something we'll talk about later a little bit. We definitely need more studies to understand how this, all these factors play a role in the residual symptoms. But there's something that is obvious and can be addressed immediately, which is treatment with levothyroxine is not physiological. And I'm gonna repeat it, I said it out loud, I'm gonna repeat it again. Treatment with levothyroxine is not physiological. It's phenomenal to restore TSH levels, that works perfectly, but it fails to restore normal thyroid hormone physiology. So what do I mean by that? And so that we understand this, we need to go back and look a little bit of uh, basic principles of how the thyroid works. Basically, the thyroid produces those two hormones that we are familiar with, 
T4 and T3, their names come after the number of iodine they have in their molecules. T4 has four, T3 has three. Now, T3 is the active hormone. And this is so important for this discussion. T4 doesn't do anything. T4 does not resolve symptoms of hypothyroidism. T3 does resolve symptoms. T3 enters the cells of every cell in our body, finds receptors, and then it triggers its biological effects. And that's how we know T3 is important for development, for growth, metabolism, cognition, and so on. Now, T3 is the key molecule, and that, we cannot forget about this. And, and it seems that these days, many of us are forgetting that that's a, a very important knowledge. Now, where does T3 come from? If it is so important, we need to know where it comes from. Uh, it, as it turns out, we, a, a healthy individual, produces about 30 micrograms of T3 every day. But the thyroid only makes a little bit, makes five of those 30 micrograms. Where is the rest of the T3 coming from then? It comes from other tissues through the action of those enzymes, those little engines that can take the T4 molecule, remove an atom of iodine, and produce T3. So most T3 in the circulation in the cell in our body, it's not produced by the thyroid gland. It's produced outside of the thyroid gland through the action of the iodinases. They're called D1 and D2. D2 being the most important relevant for the discussion right now. Now, uh, through studies that I'm not going to have time to, to explain or to, 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 to show today, we learned that the thyroid system, and by thyroid system, I mean the brain, the pituitary gland, and the thyroid itself, they're wired to defend serum T3. That means if there's a problem with the diagnosis, the thyroid steps up production of T3, and this five can turn into 10 easily just because it, the system realizes the iodinases are not doing a good job. If there's any other issues, the thyroid sec secretion of T3 is flexible and that meant to preserve T3 levels in the circulation. That's really, really important. Now, what happens when the thyroid is no longer there or a patient develops hypothyroidism? And we treat this patient with a tablet containing just T4, just levothyroxine. The diagnosis now become the focus of the treatment because they are solely responsible for producing all that T3 that's important for our body. More important than that, the flexibility of the system that had to adjust T3 production to account for any problems with the diagnosis is just no longer there. And so the T3 levels, which were the primary goal of the thyroid system, now are left to be maintained by the diagnosis alone. Now, the question is, can they do it? Can they preserve T3 levels in the absence of a thyroid gland? And I have to tell you, for 20 plus years, I have lectured saying, of course they can because we just provide levothyroxine and the diagnoses are super smart, they're super flexible, adjustable, physiological, they will produce whatever needs, whatever amounts of T3 are needed for the body. Today, we know better. And the answer is no. The diagnosis without the thyroid cannot restore normal T3 homeostasis. They just simply cannot. And believe me, I am a, a diagnase uh, expert. I wish this were true, but it's not. The diagnosis can't do it. Now, is this something I discovered last week? No, it's not. It's actually something we already knew back in 1974. This is a study in a prestigious journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, where levels of T4 and levels of T3 are shown in two groups of patients. Here we have individuals taking levothyroxine, and here are control matched individuals. And you, all of them have normal TSH levels. And you can tell right away that 
there is a relative excess of T4, and there's a relative deficiency of T3 in these patients. And this, in my opinion, back in 1974, should have raised some red flags and said, wait a minute, we have just introduced a new treatment for hypothyroidism, and, and we are seeing that this is actually not that normalized, and let's think about it. But that was not the case, and people move forward despite this very clear difference in T3 and T4 levels in the circulation. But maybe, was this a one-off? Did people find it? Were they able to reproduce these results? Just 15 times, and I found this in maybe in 30 minutes on PubMed, I didn't do a, a thorough investigation. All these studies in red, uh, they have found that patients on levothyroxine have lower levels of T3. Sometimes the reduction, the T3 levels are at the bottom of the normal range, and sometimes they're below the normal range. Yes, it is true. There were studies in green that did not find that difference. Now, the not having found the difference doesn't mean the difference doesn't exist. These studies were probably underpowered to be able to identify that difference. But the overwhelming majority of the studies identified that difference. So this is really important. As you see, the thyroid cares about T3. T3 is the biologically active thyroid hormone. And when we treat patients with levothyroxine, we are not normalizing T3 levels in the circulation. This is really a key finding. So I'm putting this slide again to show that yet uh, the treatment with levothyroxine fails to resort to, re to, to restore normal T3 levels. Either it brings to the bottom of the normal range or it brings to below the normal range. And it, it's fair to ask, are we then normalizing all of these things if T3 levels are below normal? What's the overall impact of this? The, you know, I, I showed you uh, uh, more than a dozen studies that uh, analyze this, but do we have a consensus? So this is a study done in Sicily in Italy. And uh, they studied 2,000 individuals without a thyroid. They had their thyroid removed because of their treatment. And they were on levothyroxine. And what did these investigators found? They, this is 2,000 individuals. They found that level, levels of T4 in 7% of those patients were high, above the normal range. 15% of the patients had T3 levels below the normal range. And a huge amount, 30% of these patients had uh, a ratio of T4 to T3 that was below the normal range. So I'm gonna repeat, 15% of the levothyroxine treated patients with normal TSH have low T3 levels. And this is a big deal because T3 is the active hormone that restore, that resolves symptoms of hypothyroidism. Now, how do I explain this? What, what's going on? What, what's going on is I can explain in, in this way. Tablets of levothyroxine, when patients take tablets of levothyroxine, that's the source of T4, enters the body, T4. Now, T4 has to be converted to T3 in order to normalize TSH levels. Remember, T4 doesn't do anything. T4 must be converted to T3 in order to normalize the SH level. And T T4 does it, you know, marvelously. It's great. Just give T4, gets converted to T3 in the pituitary gland, and TSH is normalized. Now, for the rest of the body, also T4 must be converted to T3 through the diagonase. However, these two processes are uncoupled. These two processes are not synchronized. And while T4 is excellent to normalize TSH, T4 is not excellent. It's actually very poor in order to normalize T3 levels in the circulation. Therefore, we always reach, a, a, in patients treated with levothyroxine, we'll always have normal TSH with a relative deficiency of T3. In 15% of the cases, there will be an absolute deficiency of T3 because T3 levels are going to be 
below the normal range. Now, how did we get here, right? I mean, we came up with the treatment for hypothyroidism that was supposed to be excellent. And I have to say, parenthetically, it is excellent. Levothyroxine resolves the symptoms in most patients that are treated with, 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 uh, for hypothyroidism. However, in some patients, it becomes clinically relevant, those residual symptoms, and, and yet levothyroxine is not that great for those patients. And so we came up with this uh, treatment for hypothyroidism whose effectiveness is clearly not 100%. And it's been going on for 50 years now. And uh, what is going on? So I'm going to go back for five minutes in the history of hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism was described as a disease in 1880, around that time. Soon after that, different treatments were developed. First, there was a thyroid transplant. Uh, it didn't go very far. And then patients started eating uh, uh, thyroid from animals, which uh, it worked well. Then uh, they had an idea of creating an extract, a solution of the thyroid that was injected under the skin. That was very painful. And then doctors realized that you could take that extract, dry it up, and put it in a tablet. And then patients started taking thyroid extract. And, and that's the, that was in 1900. That was the, the origin of the treatment for hypothyroidism. Uh, soon after, T4 was identified, T3 after 50 years were, was identified. So uh, they, doctors knew that thyroid extract, the desiccated thyroid extract contained T4 and T3. They knew it contained both molecules. So they were treating patients with both molecules, T4 and T3. And these lasted until about 1970. So for 70 years, maybe for 80 years, desiccated thyroid extract was the standard of care for treatment of hypothyroidism. Doctors tried to give just T4 or just T3, and uh, it worked, uh, but they were not very comfortable doing this because they didn't understand very well what was going on, and desiccated thyroid extract worked very well. And uh, so that remained the standard of care. In 1960, uh, 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 UK endocrine surgeon, uh, Selwyn Taylor, he noted, he published a paper saying that, you know what, levothyroxine is great when I did experimentally treat some patients, but there's a small number of patients that don't do well on levothyroxine alone. And for those, I, I think T4 plus T3 do the job. So I, I uh, that, that was phenomenal because before any, any question or polemic issues or anything. In 1960, he already had said that. And then uh, at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Selenko said that, well, if you want to use T4 and T3, there's a certain ratio that you have to use. You have to use a 3.5 to 1 ratio, meaning that if you want to normalize everything in the thyroid homeostasis, you need to use both T4 and T3. Now, what happened was that soon after that, Dr. Braverman discovered that in the body, T4 gets converted to T3. And the interpretation at that time was that, you know what? There's no need to give combination therapy anymore. We're not giving more desiccated thyroid extract. This is something, you know, unreliable. It's coming from a pig. It's coming from a cow. We are going to give now just T4 because the body will be able to transform T4 to T3. And how much T4 do we give? At the same time, Dr. Bob Hudiger in Boston, uh, he developed an assay, a method to measure TSH level. And they said, well, guess what? You just have to normalize TSH. And so it happened that in the 70s, uh, the, in, in the number of desiccated thyroid extract prescriptions, fell down to almost zero. And at the same time, treatment was switched to levothyroxine therapy to the, at the levels that normalize TSH. Now, uh, patients started to complain. Many patients did not like that, wanted to go back to the old thyroid, the desiccated thyroid extract. 
some patients did not even want to start with, with the synthetic levothyroxine. But that, you know, that didn't go anywhere. And it took about 30 years for the first studies to be published. Uh, Dr. Colin Diane in Wales, Dr. Vilma Arvar Singha in Amsterdam, Dr. Samuels in Portland, Oregon. In, in a stretch of about five years, they published three studies showing that when you normalize TSH with levothyroxine, patients remain symptomatic with cognitive dysfunction. And uh, because of these studies, there were a lot of clinical trials. About 20 clinical trials were done in this period comparing levothyroxine or uh, with combination therapy with levothyroxine plus lyothyronine. The question is, which one is better? Is combination therapy better than levothyroxine? And those cl 20 clinical trials concluded uh, that both treatments were the same, were equally effective, and they were equally safe. Those 20 clinical trials did not find anyone being better than the other, did not find any adverse reaction that was more frequent in one treatment or the other treatment. So this is really important. And the other important factor that sometimes people don't uh, pay much attention is that as a result of those clinical trials became, became clear that patients prefer combination therapy. Even when they're blinded, when the doctors don't know what they're taking, they don't know what they're taking, they prefer combination therapy over monotherapy. And this is something that uh, two recent uh, um, meta-analysis of these trials concluded. So, so this, is, this is a big deal. And such a big deal that the European Thyroid Association in 2012 published some guidelines and said, you know what? If you wanna treat patients with hypothyroidism, you should use levothyroxine. And for, but be aware that uh, some patients don't do very well, a minority of the patients. For those patients, maybe 10, 15, 20%, we don't know exactly the number, you should try combination therapy because combination therapy has been useful in resolving those residual symptoms. Two, year, two years later, the American Fire Association published, updated their guidelines, saying basically the same thing. What did the American Fire Association say? Well, this is what they said. There is no consistently strong evidence of superiority of combination therapy over monotherapy with T4. Yes, but the opposite is also true. There is no consistently strong evidence of superiority of monotherapy over combination therapy. They're both equally effective. These are based on 20 clinical trials. Therefore, we recommend against the routine use of combination therapy. And that sentence caused so much confusion because they, if you read it, I say, oh, they're recommending against it. They're not recommending against it. They're recommending against the routine use of combination therapy. What does that mean? Routine means if you're a doctor and you treat 100% of your patients or the majority of your patients with combination therapy, that's not good. That's not what we recommend. You should use this only for those patients that don't do well on levothyroxine therapy. This is, yeah, we could have done a better job with this sentence. I agree, caused a lot of confusion, but that's the dissection, the interpretation of this paragraph. Now, to resolve any doubts that, that were there, in 2020, the American, the European, and the British Thyroid Association issue a statement. They basically said, start with levothyroxine. If full recovery is not obtained, try combination therapy with T4 and T3. And also, they said, future clinical trials should focus on patients that did not fully benefit from levothyroxine. What, what do you mean? What I mean is, those 20 clinical trials that I've been talking about now, they just look at all patients with hypothyroidism. And we know that levothyroxine is great for the vast majority of the patients, for 80, 90% of the patients. So instead of focusing just on the patients that don't feel well, they recruited everybody. 
and therefore they could not find the difference because if you're fine on levothyroxine, you're not, you're not going to get any better if you go on combination therapy. So I was fortunate enough to be part of a clinical trial uh, that looked at 90 patients with hypothyroidism. And these 90 patients were treated with levothyroxine, combination therapy with synthetic levothyroxine and lyothyronine, or desiccated thyroid extract, which is another form of combination therapy. These were three arms. Each arm lasted 16 weeks, so a long time, and they were crossed over. Once the patient ended one arm, it crossed to the other arm and then crossed to the other arm, completely randomic, completely blinded. They didn't know. The doctors didn't know. Patients didn't know. Nobody knew what they were taking. So after these 16 weeks, we looked at the data. And number one thing, serum TSH remained within the normal range for the three arms of the trial. And that's an important thing that we, I'm sure we're gonna discuss this on the Q&A session. Uh, uh, and, and I think that the, it's, we looked at the results of this and as a group, if you look at those 90 patients with hypothyroidism, those patients responded similarly to therapy with T4, T4 plus T3 or DTE, yeah. We already had 20 trials showing this. There's no doubt that they responded. They are equally the, the effective. However, if we only looked at the patients that remain symptomatic while on levothyroxine, those responded positively to either DTE or combination therapy. So we need to focus on those patients that remain symptomatic because those are the ones, according to this trial, that benefit from combination therapy. Now, before we go out and we start saying levothyroxine didn't work for this patient or didn't work for that patient, let's try combination therapy. So we should be pay attention to the following. First, is there a solid diagnosis of hypothyroidism? Here in the US, uh, uh, doctors have a very low threshold to place individuals on levothyroxine to call them hypothyroid, even though their thyroid function tests are normal or, uh, uh, you know, despite a, a mildly elevated TSH, they would just label that person as being hypothyroid and, and place them on levothyroxine. So uh, if you are not hypothyroid, T4, T4 plus T3 or just T3 is not going to do anything for you because you're not hypothyroid. So it is really important that we have a solid diagnosis of hypothyroidism, number one. Number two, are there other comorbidities, meaning other conditions that could explain those residual symptoms? Yeah, because those residual symptoms are not really typical. I mean, there's nothing typical about hypothyroidism. Uh, uh, mem a weak memory or a, a, a impaired cognition, elevated cholesterol, gaining weight, I feel tired. All of this can be caused by other diseases as well, other autoimmune diseases, anemia, vitamin deficiency. Uh, I find in my clinic that the menopausal syndrome is a great confounding factor. The symptoms are very, very similar to hypothyroid symptoms. So uh, doctors need to do due diligence here and investigate the possibility of that hypothyroid patient uh, with being treated with levothyroxine, exhibit other conditions that could explain those symptoms. Now, if there's nothing else there, uh, you know, usually uh, just a, a recent paper was published by, by Dr. McEninch uh, in JCNM showing exactly a, a workflow, what the, thing, the things that doctors should look for when investigating these residual symptoms. I, and I find that that study that's gonna be very useful for doctors. If you, you can't find anything, yeah. Uh, the, 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 just go ahead and start with combination therapy. Now, how safe is this? One of the issues that the doctors frequently say, oh no, don't give combination therapy because there's no sufficient data to prove that this is safe. This is safe. Now, okay, let's address that. Uh, those 20 clinical trials combined give you about 1,500 patients that took combination therapy for uh, between six months and a year. 
and they didn't find anything. Uh, the, you know, heart rate was okay, blood pressure was okay, adverse reactions were okay, as long as serum TSH remained within the normal range. We're not causing hyperthyroidism. We're not causing thyrotoxic causes here. Uh, we are just switching from levothyroxine to combination therapy. And in that setting, it was perfectly fine. Well, uh, critics might say, well, just one year, six months to a year. I mean, these patients are going to take this for the rest of their lives. You need something stronger than that. Okay. There's a Scottish uh, study that was published. Uh, they looked in the region of Tayside. They looked at 34,000 patients taking levothyroxine, identified 400 patients taking uh, combination therapy or T3 alone. And they looked at 18 years, 17 years. And during that time, there were no differences in mortality or morbidity due to cardiovascular disease, atrial fibrillation, or fractures. So this is a, a large number of patients that were followed for, this is a retrospective study. So they, these are chart studies. So, so they look at their charts but they didn't find anything when they compared with the patients taking levothyroxine. So this is very reassuring that combination therapy is not ca causing anything new here. Then there's the, 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 the study that was done in Sweden where they looked at really big numbers. They identified 11,000 individuals taking T3 for, uh, with a follow-up of uh, about eight years and they did not find an increase in all-cause mortality in this group. So again, we have the clinical trials, we have the, the UK study, and we, we have this study in Sweden showing that the com use of combination therapy is not associated with increased morbidity or mortality. And this is pretty good. Now, I have to say that there's a Korean study that was published last year that shows they looked at about 1,400 individuals using lyothyronine T3. They saw an increase in heart failure and a, an increase in stroke. Now, uh, what do we think about this study? This study uh, does not tell us how much T3 they were taking. It doesn't show us how much, what the TSH levels what the T3 levels were or the T4 levels were. Mm -hmm. So we basically don't have any details. So for all I know, these patients could be taking a lot of T3 and that would be the reason for this association. We know that T3 does that when taking an excessive dose. And by the way, T4 does the same thing. If you take too much T4, you're gonna have heart failure and stroke as well. So I don't put a lot of stock on this study. I, I don't know how much stock to put on this study, just because we don't have details about what the patients were, were taking. So I want to conclude by saying a few things. First, what did we learn? The thyroid system is hardwired to preserve serum T3 levels. That's really important. And it, it's funny because, well, not funny, it's interesting that most doctors, including myself, don't ask for T3 levels when assessing patients with hypothyroidism, uh, the treatment of patients with hypothyroidism. And I did this for 30 years, believe me. I would just, the patients will ask me, but shouldn't we measure my T3? Oh, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Because that's what we learned. That's what I learned. That's what I've been told. So the thyroid system is really hardwired to preserve serum T3 levels. Levothyroxine-treated patients with normal TSH have relatively lower serum T3 and higher serum T4 levels. Many patients, about 15%, have serum T3 that is below the normal range. So that's, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what, uh, this is incredible. These patients have T3 levels that are below the normal range. And we know T3 is the key hormone. So why are we not fixing it? I mean, it, it's really, for me, it's surprising. Levothyroxine-treated patients exhibit residual cognitive symptoms and metabolic abnormalities. For many patients, this is clinically relevant. How many patients? Uh, it, I think it depends on the practice, depends on, on the context. Uh, I, I, in, in my book, I say between 10 and 20%. Uh, 
Many patients say, you're underestimating, it's more than 20%. Many doctors told me, no, you're overestimating, it's less than 10%. It's okay, it's around that time. I think important, it's not how many, the important is to recognize that these patients exist because until now, these patients have not been recognized officially uh, as being failures of, uh, or incomplete effectiveness of the treatment with levothyroxine. In a subgroup of levothyroxine treated patients, cognition and quality of life improve during combination therapy that includes T3. Uh, this is now uh, officially in the guidelines, right? The European Thyroid Association uh, and the American Thyroid Association said, yeah, don't use combination therapy for everybody, but for those patients that don't do well on levothyroxine, it's, it's okay to use it. Long-term safety data on the use of T3 for the treatment of hypothyroidism is now available for a large number of patients. This wasn't available until 10 years ago, but now it is available. And concerns about therapy with T3 that preserves serum TSH levels within the normal range are no longer justified. And as a result of all this, the American, the European, and the British guidelines open the door for combination therapy for those patients that do not fully benefit from levothyroxine. And I'll stop here, I'll stop my sharing, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions that the group might have. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you, Antonio. Um, Karen, do you wanna start with some questions that I could see were popping up in the chat? Yeah, yeah. So um, the first one was from Tara. And she has said, most patients who take T3, even quite a small dose, have a suppressed TSH. It's just what happens. As it is actually a high over range T4, T3 that can cause problems, e.g. osteoporosis or AFib, not a suppressed TSH itself, can we not use the T4 and especially T3 levels to manage treatment? To reduce the dose of T3 if TSH is suppressed often makes the patient ill again. So why must we dose according to T4, T3 and not to TSH? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much for this question. Uh, so the, what is the TSH? TSH is the hormone that regulates the thyroid. If you have a healthy thyroid, your TSH levels are normal. Okay, that's number one. Uh, the TSH tell us how much thyroid hormone we have in our system. If you have an excess of thyroid hormone in the system, the TSH is going to be low, very low, or undetectable. If you have a lack of thyroid hormone, TSH is going to be high and high. So we aim at treating patients with hypothyroidism, at restoring normal thyroid physiology. That means if with a healthy thyroid, you have a normal TSH, Whatever treatment you're going to restore as if with a normal thyroid, you're going to bring the TSH back to normal. Now, it is true that many patients that start on combination therapy have a suppressed TSH. And why is that? Well, this is T4, right? And we, are, we have a certain dose of levothyroxine that normalizes TSH. Then it is not working well. Let's try to add combination therapy. So. And then we add T3. Now, if you just add the T3 on top of that dose of T4, you're going to suppress the TSH. You have to lower the dose. The doctor needs to lower the dose of levothyroxine to make room for T3. You can't just add more T3 on top of the T4. You have to reduce the dose of levothyroxine. So, this is the key element. So, let's say patient was taking, as an example, hypothetical example, 100 micrograms of levothyroxine every day, and we're going to try combination therapy. You can't just add 10 micrograms of T3 on top. You're going to lower that, let's say, to 85 to 75 micrograms of T4, and then you're going to add the combination therapy with T3. Now, let's say the patient feels great. Uh, feels very well with that addition of T3, but the TSH is suppressed. What do we do? We lower the dose of T4 even further. 
you need to adjust to play with the ratio and lowering T4 is okay. Uh, our DNA system is uh, evolved to deal with low T4 levels. So I am not concerned about lowering T4 levels to make room for the T3 that's coming. I'm really concerned, except in pregnant ladies. So in pregnant ladies, we should not do that. We should focus on levothyroxine only. That's really important for the focus. But if the patient is not pregnant, I would not hesitate to lower the dose of levothyroxine to make room for the dose of T3 that we're adding and it's being beneficial for the patient. Remember, uh, just before this lecture, because I, I knew about this question was going to come up, there's just published a study two weeks ago in which they looked at 100,000 individuals. If you have a low TSH, your, the odds ratio of developing atrial fibrillation double. And I think that this should not be ignored. Nobody, in, you know, it's not everyone that has atrial fibrillation. Uh, may, maybe, let's say, 2.5% of the population has atrial fibrillation. Doubling means 5% of the population is going to have atrial fibrillation. This is maybe for an individual person, that might not be a big deal. But when you're making recommendation for millions of people, we need to consider that. That's really important. The TSH is reliable. Uh, what Again, we just lower, just lower the T4 levels. Okay, thank you. So, so linked to that, there's a sort of follow-on question around sort of T3 dosage. Because um, some health authorities in the UK restrict patients' daily T3 dose to around 10 micrograms, despite clinical need. So do you think some patients need more than 10 micrograms daily of T3? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Let's think about it. Uh, the, a healthy thyroid produces about five microgram, micrograms of T3 per day. Okay, so if the thyroid produces five, and so should we give five? Five, not, it, it's a good starting point. However, it might not be sufficient for everybody because T3 is metabolized very rapidly. Remember, the thyroid distributes the five micrograms uh, uh, over 24 hours. 10 micrograms comes in a pellet that you take immediately. T3 will go up and down. So it's very rapidly metabolized. So I think 10 micrograms is a very good dose. Now, the dose of T3 depends on the body size as well. Remember, just as the dose of levothyroxine is calculated based on your body weight, the dose of T3 is calculated on the body weight. And if we have a large patient, they might need more than 10 per day. Uh, and uh, I think that I, I would say most patients will do fine with, with 10 mics, but some patients might honestly need a little bit more depending on their body weight. Okay, thank you. And we've got a question from Alexandra about the other thyroid hormones, T1 and T2. Are these important? Uh, and and but, does desiccate dissect thyroid um, have these in them? Desiccated thyroid extract contains T1 and T2 because they come from the, the, the pig's thyroid. Uh, uh, these two hormones are, they are, well, how can I say? Th their levels are very low. So uh, in theory, they don't do anything. They're inactive molecules. However, if you go and look on PubMed on, on Google, you're going to find a lot of studies claiming that T2 has good effects, has thermogenic effects, that T2 can accelerate metabolism. Uh, it is correct that in some settings, T2 can accelerate metabolism. Uh, however, uh, I think the doses or the levels of T2 required for that are really high. And I don't think at this point, I have not seen any clinical evidence that T1 or T2 could be clinically relevant. However, I have been wrong in the past and I don't want to close the door for anything. I just say at the moment, we don't have any clinical evidence of their relevance for, okay. for, for patients. 
Lovely, thank you. And we've got a question from Mary around diagnosis. Um, what about when TSH is only slightly above optimal, maybe even two to four, and their T4 is in range, but is low in range? Surely low T4 could mean low T3, especially if a patient is symptomatic with hypotype symptoms. Yeah, well, first we should not imagine what the T3 levels are. We should just measure the T3 levels. They are measurable. So we, you know, uh, a low T4 doesn't, well, how do we make the diagnosis of hypothyroidism? The diagnosis is made with an elevated TSH and a low T4. Why does TSH go up? Because T4 goes down, okay? So now you're talking about a borderline patient, a, bo a patient that is on the border of the normal, upper limit of normal to abnormal. Uh, what do you do with those patients? So you have to consider the symptoms, number one. You have to consider the thyroid itself. What do I mean by that? You can just do an ultrasound if you're not sure. Just do an ultrasound and see if the thyroid looks healthy or has a patchy pattern that is typical of an autoimmune thyroid disease. So the doctor can do that and find out, you know, your thyroid doesn't look good. Now you have a TSH that is borderline up. Your T4 is borderline down. In, it, it, let's measure antibodies against the thyroid. Do we have an autoimmune condition? Do you have hypothyroidism in your family? Because usually families do have more than one if it, you know, if you have hypothyroidism, someone in your family also has hypothyroidism. So, and based on all of that, uh, I would say, okay, you know what? Let's let's wait three more months and do another assessment of your TSH because if the TSH is flat, in it, because if if it is an autoimmune disease, the disease is progressive. The disease is not going to stop right there. So it's going to become worse and worse and worse. So let's repeat in three months and see your TSH. If in three months your TSH is slightly elevated, your T4 is slightly lower, then it means, oh, I can see there's a, there's a trend for progression here. You have positive antibodies. Your thyroid doesn't look good. So I would be more favorable of starting that patient on treatment as opposed to a TSH that is now back to normal, normal range, a T4 that's no longer in the lower level. Uh, yeah, the, you might say, well, you know, why do we have to wait three months? Why don't we just start therapy right now? Because I want to feel better. Because I don't know that you're going to feel better. Remember, there's something called the placebo effect. You might feel better just because you're taking a tablet. But then after three months, you're going to go back and, and feel the same way again. So we need to be absolutely sure that the patient has hypothyroidism. The T3 levels in that setting are not gonna be helpful because again, everything will be adjusted to preserve serum T3 levels. So when you make the diagnosis, uh, you, you have to rely on TSH and T4 and not on T3 levels. You just rely on T3 once you start treatment, because then it means the thyroid is no longer working. Okay, so so Simon has asked, how should we measure serum FT3 when taking therapies containing liothyronine, um, and particularly around the sort of the gap after the last tablet? Okay, that's a good question. So usually you have to measure it at two time points. First, in the morning, fasting without before taking any tablets, because that's going to give you a baseline for after uh, the overnight. And then you should take three hours after you took the tablet containing T3, because three hours is the peak between two and three hours. It doesn't have to be, but you know, uh, two and a half and three hours, that's going to be giving you the maximum. So you do not want at the peak to be above the normal reference range. You should not do that. And I always recommend measure the baseline and the peak three hours after you took the tablet, because if the peak goes above the, the normal reference range, it, it probably means 
you're taking a little bit too much. Now, who's going to decide that? The TSH. If you're taking too much, your TSH is going to be super, it's going to be very low or suppressed. So you need to adjust these two things. Okay, thank you. And there's a couple of questions around the study that you mentioned that was published two weeks ago um, around the risk of atrial fibrillation. Did it look at the levels of T3 and T4? And, and if it did, what were those levels? Uh, we, no, I think they looked at TSH only, uh, but there are, yeah, I, I, let's, I didn't have a chance to look at very carefully. I mean, I just saw that the TSH was measured. Uh, I, I, I understand your concern. I understand because I, I see what patients talk about over social media and the, there's, uh, we should, I, I think free T4, T3 and free T3 are good indicators. However, the TSH is also very good. Now, having said that, we have to be uh, understanding that the TSH might be affected. I mean, I'm assuming the TSH has been, you know, the pituitary gland, it's a healthy pituitary gland. And that's why I trust that much this assay. Now, there are drugs that can affect TSH levels, prevent TSH from being a reliable indicator. If, example, steroids. If you're taking steroids, there will be, uh, there might be a suppression of your TSH. If you're taking amiodarone, which are common antiarrhythmic medication, that will affect your TSH levels. If you're doing a diet, if you're lowering your calorie intake, the TSH levels are not going to be reliable anymore. So there's several conditions in which the TSH does not become a reliable indicator of the level of thyroid hormone in the circulation. And in those cases, you do have to rely on free T4 and T3 levels. Absolutely. So well, all I'm saying, I'm defending here TSH, assuming that this is a healthy pituitary gland, no drugs that are involved, and caloric intake are normal. But these things do affect TSA secretion and need to be in everybody's mind. Okay, thank you. And we've got a question about um, T3 in pregnancy, picking up on something that you mentioned in, in the slides. Um, when you said that um, in pregnancy, T3 shouldn't be used. Um, if T3 is crucial to fetal development, why do you say that? And what about a pregnant patient who already takes T3 because they're unwell on T4? Sure, that, those are two good questions. So there are studies, very convincing studies, that the hormone that crosses the placenta from the mother to the fetus is its preferential T4 and not so much T3. So there's a barrier. In the placenta is a barrier to thyroid hormones. T4 crosses that barrier better than T3. And when is that important? In the first trimester, the fetus, the, uh, uh, the thyroid of the fetus uh, in the first trimester is not working very well. It starts to work at the end of the first trimester. So during the first three months, thyroid hormone that crosses the placenta from the mother to the fetus are very important. Which hormone crosses? Preferentially T4, not so much T3. Therefore, uh, it, it's not recommended that we use combination therapy during pregnancy. And if the patient is on combination therapy because feels better, became becoming pregnant, that should be switched to monotherapy with levothyroxine. And why do I say that? This is out of an abundant abundance of caution. Uh, there's no clinical data to support combination therapy during pregnancy. When we make a recommendation, we should think, millions of pregnant women could be doing this. And if there's a five or 10% chance that this is not gonna be very useful, very fine, then we're gonna be affecting the lives of thousands of patients. So therefore having, if, if someone does a clinical trial in the future that will support combination therapy during pregnancy, then I'm fine to recommend, but right now we don't have. Having said that, before 1970, 
every pregnant woman in the world that became hypothyroid was treated with desiccated thyroid extract, okay? And uh, nothing of note uh, was observed, at least is not registered as a publication or it's in a book. So if there is some negative effect, the negative effect probably is not that great. However, we should be careful when making recommendations for a large number of patients. Okay, thank you. Oh, Mike has got his hand up. Do you want to come in there, Mike? Uh, yes. Hello, Professor Bianco. Um, as it happens, um, for my sins, I'm involved in responding to a new guideline from the Royal College of Obstetricians, Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK about thyroid treatment during and before pregnancy. I've done a massive amount of clinical literature research on this. And actually, there are, as there always is in medical literature, conflicting opinions. The latest research appears to show that in fact T3 does pass through the barrier. There is no, there's no, um, should we put it, there's no actual physical barrier, but it is massively downregulated in the fetus. And a small amount is there to support the development of the central nervous system and the brain at a very early stage. It then, um, if you like, is um, no longer required so much because as the fetus's own thyroid gland develops, that takes over, not entirely, but takes over a very large proportion of the use of the um, tooth hormones. The problem is, however, that in gynecology, what appears to happen on that side is that people are looking at entirely the fetus. If you've got to the stage as a woman where you, certainly in this country, the UK, where you're taking T3 or combination, now T3 is a real problem, you've got there because you have not done at all well without it. The process of pregnancy itself is massively physiological for a woman. It's immense. Mm -hmm. I've watched four of them myself. And to take T3 away, actually potentially for some women could be a hazard to their lives. Because as we know, T3, especially if you've not had it for a long time, um, can have an effect on their fun heart function. And some people come to get their T3 after many years battle. Now, obviously, you're not going to be very old at this stage when you're having a child. So it's a great concern. Um, if you look at the FDA, their treatment of um, how to go about this, they have actually indicated do not take the medication away. What I think one can do is what you mentioned earlier. You could do a reverse adjustment and allow some T3 and maybe up the T4. Um, but there, anyway, there we are. So that's, a, that's a, simply from reading the latest literature. Right. No, thank you very much for these considerations. I think they're really important. Uh, and, and again, each patient needs to be treated individually. The physician and the patient are the, that unit is the one, are the, is the one that's going to make decisions for that patient, right? Now, uh, if you're talking about one or one, I mean, one in, in a specific case, I think the doctor might very well say, yes, I'm going to keep you on combination therapy because the risks of you being off T3 are, are more important than the risks of doing this thing, doing something bad for the fetus. Now, when you issue a recommendation that involves millions of people, we can only do that if you have a clinical trial. To, to, in order to say in a statement uh, something like, there's no need to change from combination therapy to monotherapy, what's going to happen is you need to have a prospective clinical trial with women being on levothyroxine only, on women being on combination therapy. Those kids need to be, so everything is going to be assessed, it's going to be evaluated during pregnancy. And the children are going to be assessed for years after that. And after the children have been assessed for five or 10 years and their IQ has been proven to be absolutely normal, then I can see that a professional society is going to say, that's fine. They, both treatments are okay. But short of that, it will need to be 
uh, on an individ individual case, as you described, a doctor discussing the benefits and, and dangers of a possible switch. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We, we've got lots more questions still coming in, so I hope you, you're okay to continue. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, so um, we've got one from Simon. Where patients do better on substantially higher doses of liothyronine than 10 micrograms, do we know what is happening? Uh, I, I don't think we, we know. There's no way to predict which patient is going to do better or worse depending on the dose. Right now, we don't know that. Uh, all I know is that the body size is going to make a difference because if you have a bigger person, that person is going to require more T3. So we know that as as a as a the body effect, the body, the size of your body is the determining factor. Other than that, there's. No, I wish I knew uh, uh, something that could predict who's going to need T3 and who's going to need higher doses of T3. We don't. I don't know that. Okay, thank you. Um, so on T4 only, at minimum of TSH range and max of T4 range, but with low in range T3, is there a risk of osteoporosis and AFib? Uh, could you repeat that? So this is a patient with hypothyroidism? On, on T4 only, at uh -huh. minimum of TSH range and maximum of the T4 range, but with low in range T3. And is there uh, a risk of osteoporosis and AFib? Yes. The, the studies that we have looked at, and there are many studies showing the same thing, uh, they they always looked at TSH levels, not so much at the T3 levels. And uh, so we, we, number one, we do need studies looking at T3 because people might be absolutely right. Maybe T3 is more important than TSH. I, I don't know. I don't believe so. But I think that the studies we have right now, and they've been reproducible. So people have found that TSH is the gold standard to assess that. So what we know is that every time you have a low TSH, you're going to have increased uh, occurrence of osteoporosis or atrial fibrillation. Having said that, that doesn't mean everyone is going to develop osteoporosis or atrial fibrillation. For example, I'll give you an example. Patients that have thyroid cancer, and it, for some types of thyroid cancer, after you do the treatment, you have to take levothyroxine and suppress the TSH levels. You have to be with the TSH suppressed for five years, for 10 years. So those patients are treated with an excessive dose of levothyroxine for years. So how do, why do we do this? Because the risk of the cancer coming back is greater than the risk of the patient developing osteoporosis. So the doctor and the patient need to balance which risk is greater. Now, why, what do we do? We do yearly checkups on bone, man, bone mineral density. We do uh, e uh, electrocardiogram, echocardiogram. We assess the, the cardiovascular system. We assess this, uh, the bone system so that if we see that the, the bone mass is coming down, then we have to rethink, well, should we actually continue with the suppressive therapy because these patients seem to be very sensitive? So one thing is to talk about the general population. The other thing is to talk about one individual case. And, and, and many patients seem to confuse that, that one individual case, anything is possible. The TSH doesn't work, T3 doesn't work. I mean, anything is possible. And it's up to the doctor to figure that out and together with the patient, come up with a better solution for that patient. But when we talk about millions of patients, we need to, to focus on, on these percentage numbers. Mm. Okay, thank you. Asked the next question as well, didn't it? Yes, I think, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna go on to Star's question, which is why don't they run thyroid antibodies blood tests more routinely when trying to diagnose hypothyroidism and particularly Hashimoto's? 
Oh, because the antibodies, the, the Hashimoto's disease is an autoimmune disease. Our bodies start to produce antibodies against the thyroid. Not only antibodies, immune cells invade the thyroid and start to destroy the thyroid. So how do you know that this is happening? Because you measure the thyroid antibodies in, in the blood. So the way a way to diagnose this is if you normally we don't have antibodies. Normally, a healthy person should not have thyroid antibodies in the blood. If you have thyroid antibodies, it's a it's a very strong indication that your immune system is trying to destroy your thyroid gland. Okay. And someone has also asked why do they only measure TPO antibodies and ignore T G antibodies, and um, th this might be a specifically UK thing. Um, no, no, it's not. No, okay. uh, Hashimoto, Hashimoto's disease, the typical is the TPO antibody. It's thyroid peroxidase antibody, also known as microsomal antibodies. Uh, the thyroid globulin, uh, it, it's more positive when you have patients with Graves disease. Then the, the positivity for it, the TG is it's more frequent, but both can be present in any, you know, auto thyroid autoimmunity is a complex thing that can, can you can have uh, both processes happening at the same time. So uh, the important thing is that the presence of the TPO is the one that gives it the diagnosis of the Hashimoto's uh, uh, attack of the thyroid. Okay, thank you. So we've got one, um, Nikki has asked, given that more women than men tend to get thyroid problems do we know how other hormones mostly estrogen progesterone and testosterone affect conversion of t4 to t3 um uh, i i don't think they affect that greatly uh there there could be a paper published somewhere that shows that there's an effect i looked at this many years ago i couldn't find anything very significant certainly not at the clinical level uh the data we have is that uh, the both systems in males and females are similar and uh, they're not the diagnoses are not greatly affected by estrogen or testosterone or progesterone Okay. So just, just to follow on from that, just briefly, would that also be the same for women that are on HRT? Uh, yes, yes. I think there are two things that will affect the conversion of T4 to T3 that are really, really important. Number one is the the an illness. Whoever, if a person is ill, and gravely heal is not like a, a common cold or anything like that if you're ill that you're you know you're doing a chronic treatment you have to be admitted to the hospital that is going to affect your DNA system and your t3 levels are going to come down the other thing is caloric restriction if you're not eating well if you're restricting your calories your t3 level is going to come down so these are two very important factors. Uh, an, a physiological observation is that the older the patient is, the lower the T3 levels will be. There's a tendency as you get older, the T3 levels start to come down. And that's normal, that's physiological. So I think that those are the three important factors when considering T3 levels uh, in individuals. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So the next one is one we probably all want to know the answer to is how can we get UK doctors to understand this new thinking? Um, many of us have waited decades for good treatment for, for thyroid patients, certainly in the UK. Um, and that situation continues. I'm sure you know about the issues we've had with T3 over here. Um, and, you know, we, it, it's, the things that you have said in your presentation tonight, I think are just we're just not seeing that in our own doctors over here and the endocrinologists. They're not just just not following that thinking. So how can we get them to understand it? Well, I, uh, hmm. I I'm surprised by that because 
not, not, I, not that I just learned is now. I mean, I have seen it on the, on the social media. I'm surprised because, uh, uh, you know, UK has phenomenal doctors that understand this and actually discovered many of the things I presented today. So it's not that, uh, you know, it, as, as a reflection of that, just look at the uh, European Thyroid Association guidelines. Uh, just look at the work that was done by Dr. Diane in Wales and other doctors. I don't want to start mentioning doctors because I'll, I'm sure I'm going to forget about people, but I, 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 I'm not equipped to answer this question properly. I think uh, you should engage those doctors that yeah. I, 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 I'm actually very surprised by this. Everything we know about treatment of hypothyroidism was developed in the UK uh, in the uh, 19th and 20th century. Uh, I, I, I guess my experience in the US is that patients need to be the driving force of this, number one. I don't believe uh, the, the idea we have in the US is that, oh, hypothyroidism, this has been resolved 50 years ago. Just give a tablet of levothyroxine. So doctors are very busy. They have a lot of things in their mind. So if you're now going to start saying that a treatment they thought was resolved, a disease they thought was resolved now needs a better treatment, they're not going to be very receptive to that. So what made a big difference in, in the U.S. was the, the patient. The, mm. the, the strength with which patients mobilized and started pushing. And today, uh, I have to say, uh, maybe 10 years ago, I was, I was certainly afraid of going to a meeting and saying the things I said today uh, because I would be just crucified or uh, mm. my colleagues would not accept or understand it. So there was huge peer pressure to... Mm be on so once i uh, i was in a conference in washington dc and uh, we were discussing uh, about t3 levels and i i was very careful hesitant to say things and and after the, the during the coffee break a few doctors came to me and said oh you know secretly we i do give t3 for patients but uh, don't don't tell other people or, uh, you know, this is a common story because the peer pressure mm. is very high. Giving T3 is a, has been associated with uh, not good practice just because the guidelines have been so strongly against it. Now, we should move from that. The guidelines now changed. We should be positive. I, if I were a patient in the UK, I would just print out the guidelines from mm. the American, the British, and the European Thyroid Association and hand it to the doctor and say, well, can you please read what it says here? So, yeah. and why I don't qualify for this, but this is what the guidelines are saying. Mm. And confront, I think we need to patients politely, uh, educated, uh, you know, confront the doctors and say, this is what it is. Yeah. I think that's exactly what the the sort of the thyroid various sort of thyroid patient organisations in the UK are trying to do. Um, it's it, it, I think even where the guidelines are there, we've got evidence that the guidelines aren't being applied by local sort of health authorities. Um, cost has been a big issue in the UK. Um, unfortunately, um, the the company that was um, manufacturing the T3, um, it was massively expensive um, to the NHS to, to prescribe T3. So cost has been a big issue with it. But it's interesting as well. I think there is very much in the UK that whole cultural thing around T3 that, um, and it's um, the current president of the British Thyroid Association, which is the sort of professional body for endocrinologists, actually stood up at a conference of endocrinologists last year and said that he didn't see that there was a need for T3. Um, and nobody's going to challenge him if he's if he's the head of the professional body there's people aren't going to challenge him on that so there's that real sort of cultural issue as well I think um, and that that's what that's exactly what the thyroid trust is trying to do is kind of 
be that voice for patients out there, you know, and be that sort of collective voice because we can shout louder if we've got these kind of examples and sort of patient case studies. But it's it's a real uphill struggle, I think, at the moment. It's been very so, difficult. You know, excuse me. So sometimes having two doctors at the same time in a meeting like this could be helpful. You could bring two doctors with opposite opinions. Mm. If they agree to to come and discuss this issue, uh, I think that I mean it, it would. Uh, I have I certainly participated in in debates like that, and so for the other doctors to see is really, it, it might be helpful. Now I I always I believe that extreme positions are never good either one way or the other. Uh, I'm surprised that individuals with such a narrow view of things might be representing uh, uh, societies or professional classes. I mean, I, I don't know exactly who you're referring to, and we don't need to know as well. But I think that uh, the patients are the answer, and uh, we should, patients need to move and demand an explanation with the, uh, uh, I know this is easier uh, said than done, but I don't see any other way of, out mm. of it. I think the difficulty for us as, as patients and patient organizations is trying to navigate the system and trying to find a way in and who to speak to um, and and where this whole idea that certainly within UK, there's, there's so many GPs and endocrinologists, um, just, I don't know, it's just that the, the kind of attitude they have towards sort of testing and T3 and so on is, is how we challenge that. And does it go right back to the training that they get when they're, when they're new, you know, when they come out as newly qualified doctors? That, and that this is what we're trying to kind of grapple with is how to find a way into that through the system and get to sort of the root cause of where this is all coming from. It's, and that's yeah. the challenge, I think. Is that something that you're addressing in the States just out of interest in terms of, you know, um, with how the training happens over there with, you know? No, uh, this, uh, uh, the, tr Things are now changing in the U.S. dramatically. Uh, and uh, as I said, a few years ago, I would be afraid of speaking my mind. But now I go to meetings and people are talking openly about combination therapy, how T3 is good. And uh, I see young doctors now talking about it. I see publications about it. So I think this has been embraced by a younger generation of doctors in the US. The, there's no issue of costs here or budgets. So, so here, you know, the, the insurance companies will pay for it. So there's no, I think that what makes it particularly difficult in the UK is this, uh, the budget issue of the costs and the, uh, I just feel that it will take time because uh, that traditional view, those doctors will, you know, newer doctors will come with new views and will try to, the, certainly my fellows today know about it. And I know other fellows in other hospitals know a lot about combination therapy and the uh, me, myself and others have published uh, a, constantly on combination therapy. Uh, this is what we need. We need to publish. We need to, to be uh, active, advocating uh, on behalf of the patients. Uh, and How do we advocate when the doctors won't listen to us, though? Because it feels very much in the UK that, that doctors feel threatened by informed patients. Yeah. And there's, there's, I don't know how we get around that because all of us on this call, we are, we are here because we're trying to educate ourselves and sure. find out about our conditions. But then when we go and see our GPs and our endocrinologists, they somehow feel threatened by that yeah. and they know best because they've been to medical school. So how do we challenge that culture? Yeah, well, that's a very difficult culture to challenge, but that's yeah. the reason I wrote my book. 
It, and it, that's why in the book, I could have written the book <clears throat> just for patients. But that I knew if I did that, that will not move the needle with the doctors. So the book focuses, it, it was challenging to come up with a language that will uh, be appreciated by patients and doctors, because for doctors, you need to provide facts, data, clinical studies. And I'm, I'm hoping, I'm positive that the book has been, I only received very positive feedback from doctors about the book. So as I said, I didn't know many of the studies I presented today, and I was active in the thyroid field. I feel that education is the critical thing here. And I did my part as, as, as a leader in the thyroid field here in the US. I was president of the ATA. I did everything I could to bridge this gap between doctors and patients. And others have done a phenomenal job as well. I feel that time will, will make a difference. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm quite aware of time, Antonio. Um, there's a last, I think that's, if we close the questions now, but there's a few, I think that still haven't been answered in the chat. If we could just okay. um, run through those briefly before we let you go. Um, I, let's just go through. I think a few of them have been covered. There's there's one from Alison around polymorphism. How does the polymorphism in DI2 affect the dosage of T3 prescribed? If 10 micrograms per day is used for most patients, how much do you think someone with a polymorphism needs? So what we know about the, the diagnosed polymorphism, and this was actually discovered by Dr. Diane in Wales, uh, is that Patients that have this polymorphism seem to prefer combination therapy. They do better when the, while they are on combination therapy. However, this was not related to the dose of, of uh, lyothyronine. So I don't think we are there yet. Uh, I think where we are is if you have the polymorphism, maybe it's more likely that you're going to do better on combination therapy, but we don't know anything about the dose. Okay. There's one on here that says, um, is there a name for high TG antibodies with no TPO antibodies? No. No. No, I mean, I, I <clears throat> you could see that in patients with Graves disease, uh, but, you know, it, you can, you can see both present in Graves disease as well. And there's other people saying um, they thank you very much for your book. <laughs> Just thought we'd share that one with you You're as welcome. well. Um, I think that's it. Have we missed anything else, Karen? No, I think that's all of them, hopefully. Yeah, I'm hoping we've um, covered everything for everybody um, and that everybody found that as interesting as, as I did. So, and um, I thank you very much for your time and coming and talking to us, Antonio. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Uh, I think, again, we need patients involved and the work that you, you guys are doing is, I think, is terrific. And if I if there's any way I can help uh, with future activities, uh, uh, please count on me. OK, uh, well, I, I will Thank definitely um, be reaching out to you again soon. I'm sure we will be exchanging more emails. <laughs> and All someone right. has said, thank you. You're an inspiration. OK. So Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That made my 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 Sunday. Um, <laughs> <Good. good. laughs> Please do that. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending. All I right. hope you all enjoyed the session. Thank you. Bye bye. You take Bye-bye. care. Thank you, everyone.